Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Caitlin and I upload all things true crime and education and psychology related on this channel. And if you don't already know, if you don't follow me on any of my social media, you won't have seen me mention really my second channel where I upload regularly as well. Um, and over there I do all things beauty, fashion and lifestyle related like vlogs and hauls. So if you want to see sort of more of me and some more like personal things, vlogs, things like that, then definitely check over my second channel because I upload just the same amount over on there as I do on this channel. So today I'm back with another mysterious unsolved case and this one is very strange actually. I'd really never heard of this one and it's just a weird one because I've said it before in a number of other cases when I say there's just not a lot of information to suggest what happened to them but in this one there really isn't and there are some really really fascinating and interesting theories that I've included at the end of the video to sort of give you guys an idea of where people are going with sort of what they think might have happened to him but if you are interested I'm just going to zoom through my disclaimer very quickly that I like to include at the start of all my videos. So just letting you guys know that I'm not claiming to be an expert in this case or any of the other cases that I cover over on my channel. I'm simply relaying the information I'm able to find myself through research on the internet and because only certain sources are accessible to me it means I may get things wrong, mispronounce things or leave things out. I do apologise if I do any of those things. I'm not trying to cause anyone any harm or an injustice, I'm simply working with the information that I do have available to me. And now that I've gotten that out of the way, um, today's case we're going to be discussing the unsolved mysterious disappearance of Ronald Tamman. It's a very very interesting one so I'd love to know your guys' thoughts on it down below but we shall just get started with the case. Ronald was born on July the 23rd in the year of 1933, his full name being Ronald Henry Tamman Jr and he was born in Lakewood, Ohio. He grew up in a friendly neighbourhooded area in a place called Maple Heights in Ohio and he lived with his family in a large home on a place called Hillgrove Avenue. Ron grew up being the second eldest child. He had an older brother whose name was John and then his younger siblings in order of age were Richard, Marcia and Robert with Marcia and Robert being rather young while Ronald was looking at his sort of teen years. In a lot of the sources that I read about Ron's early life he was most of the time really considered the middle child because he was the second oldest and like I said the two youngest children were particularly like significantly younger than him and his brothers. So for a large portion of his life he was the middle child, however he was referred to over and over again, time and time again, as being the most well behaved out of the three oldest siblings. He was known by many people who knew the Tamman family in the area as being remarkably good looking. That was a characteristic that I noticed cropping up a lot. A lot of people said he was very very handsome and he was very very driven. He spent many years as a wrestler as well as playing string bass in a jazz band while in college and it was also here that he actually signed up to be a residence hall counsellor and he ended up joining a fraternity as well but I'll get more into that information about his college life in a little bit. His close friends and family all knew that he was very very ambitious and he was particularly eager to do something with his life, do something big, spectacular with his life and this was something that he made clear from a very young age. Since being young he took it upon himself to get a number of different jobs doing numerous different things just keeping himself busy and earning a little bit of money and part of his drive for being employed from such a young age had been the fact that he'd grown up with his family not really having any money. Even as a kid he was known to come up with sort of new and inventive ways that he could get himself a new job or earn a little bit of extra money and he kind of planned on being like this throughout his life. He made it clear that he wanted to be very very successful when he grew up. The website ronaldtamman.com had a lot of information about who Ron was and sort of his early life and his family life but there was one thing in particular that I read on there that really struck a chord with me and it had been that his roommates in college, his bandmates in college, his fraternity brothers all struggled post his disappearance occurring. They all struggled to recall a memory of them being with him. It just sort of became clear that they'd each always assumed that if they didn't see Ron that he'd be with one of the other groups of friends that he'd had or that he would be spending his free time studying. So Ron's case begins on Sunday the 19th of April in the year of 1953. 19 year old Ron was a full-time student at Miami University's Oxford, Ohio campus and he was living in a student accommodation called Fisher Hall. He was particularly well known in the accommodation building that he lived in at the time as like I said he became a resident hall advisor or counsellor and so if there was any issues that any of the students in the building had had they would come to him first 
to get his advice and get his help. So at 8pm on that evening, it's known that Ron had been inside his room, which was room 225 inside the building, as he'd made a formal request for new fresh bedding to be provided to him. And this would be because he actually discovered that someone had left a dead fish inside his bed sheets. And the next known movement of Ron that evening had been at 8.30 p.m. when he'd headed into the hallway outside of his room after allegedly hearing something that concerned him. His roommate then returned home at around 10 p.m. that evening, fully expecting Ron to be sat there at his desk where he usually would be sat, but there had been no sign of him. And since they were obviously adults and in college, and the fact that he knew Ron did a number of different activities, like he was with a fraternity house, you know, he had a number of extracurricular activities that he liked to do, he just assumed that Ron may have been, you know, doing one of these extracurricular activities, you know, he'd been in the band or something, or he would have been staying overnight at the fraternity house that he was a part of. There was just no immediate cause for concern. And yeah, so because of this, he hadn't been overly concerned when he hadn't returned home later that night. But when the following day came around and there had still unusually been no sign of Ron, he decided to report him as a missing person to the campus authorities. It was determined that Ron had left virtually all of his belongings behind in his room. All of his clothes, his wallet and ID, his class ring from high school that he was never known to really take off, um, his instrument amongst all these other sort of personal belongings that he would have taken with him to uni. And when there remained no sign of the student and no one had come forward having seen him past the last known point that evening, authorities had gotten involved and they'd begun to piece together all of the information they could find that was even remotely related to his disappearance and something that maybe could have been indicative of his whereabouts. When authorities had spoken to Ron's roommate, he told them that when he returned back to the room, he discovered that both the lights and the radio had been left on, which is why he assumed that Ron had still been inside or if not, he would be returning shortly. He did also note that when he entered the room and started started putting his things away, he spotted Ron's psychology textbook open on the desk as though he'd sort of been reading through it, as though he'd been taking notes when he was last in the room. And now this wouldn't necessarily be a strange or noteworthy finding typically, but it was soon discovered that Ron had actually dropped his psychology class three weeks prior to his disappearance. Ron owned a 1938 Chevrolet sedan in a gold colour which he kept in a spot in the car park on campus and during the search for Ron, his car was found in its same spot completely untouched. When authorities had checked his bank transactions to determine whether he'd possibly taken out maybe a large sum of money just before his disappearance, potentially with the intention of, you know, taking a trip or disappearing intentionally, they found no such transaction and all of the money remained in his account. It was believed that based on these prior transactions that he did have maybe around 10 to $15 on his person that evening that he disappeared, but it, this wasn't confirmed. It couldn't be known because, you know, he did leave his wallet in his room. He didn't seem to have anything on him. So it's not known whether he actually left the room of his own accord with some money. And it was believed that he hadn't left the room wearing a jacket or a coat. Um, even though it was particularly cold that evening, it was actually snowing in April, which was kind of strange. So it seemed unlikely that he would have been able to carry anything on him if he hadn't been wearing any form of outerwear, which that in itself is a strange point to consider. And all in all, all of the circumstances surrounding Ron's disappearance were just particularly strange. It is of course entirely possible that he had just left to go somewhere completely mundane and this would be an entirely normal explanation apart from the fact that he was never seen again past this point. Since his car hadn't been touched, he hadn't taken anything with him and he hadn't returned to his room at any point or he hadn't really been found, it just begs the question of where could he have gone and what could have happened to him. And the strangest points in this case, in my opinion, had been the discovery of the dead fish in his bed just before his disappearance and also the strange noise that allegedly happened in the corridor that prompted him to leave his room leading up to his disappearance. They both are the strangest parts to me because I'd like to know what these were, what these were about and whether this meant that someone else had some involvement in his disappearance. From the perspective of the authorities, there is no solid evidence of foul play being involved whatsoever in Ron's disappearance. An abduction scenario is entirely possible in theory as his disappearance had been so seemingly sudden and everything in his room had suggested that he'd not planned on leaving or if he had, he'd planned on returning. But the authorities working on the investigation at the time had given the impression that they think that 
This is the least likely scenario, mainly because he had been notably in shape and strong and this meant that he would have had the ability to fight off any surprise attacker that maybe had attempted to abduct him or, or hurt him in some way. A largely suggested theory that I did see floating around online while I was doing my research had been the suggestion that he had developed some sort of sudden onset amnesia and because of this amnesia he'd you know, gotten himself all dazed and confused. He ended up wandering out of his room, um, just wandering somewhere because he had no idea where he was. People were suggesting this may have been because of a head injury maybe he'd obtained during wrestling practice or something like that. But to me, that just seemed like a very unlikely scenario for a number of reasons, but mainly because if this was the case, he probably would have been found relatively quickly after having wandered off. There had been a potential sighting of Ron from a woman who'd been living just outside of the Oxford campus. So she'd been living in a town away from the university campus and she recalled a man knocking on her door at around 11 p.m. on the evening that Ron had disappeared. When she'd answered the door to him, he'd greeted her and he'd asked her what town they were currently in before then asking her for directions to the nearest bus stop. Following her instructions, he just thanked her, walked away from the woman's house and she hadn't really thought much else of it at the time and that was until she'd learned about Ron's disappearance that night. When investigators had followed up on this particular sighting, they discovered that at that point, the bus services hadn't been running that late, so it would have been virtually impossible if it had been Ron for him to get anywhere, whether he was going back to campus, whether he was going in the other direction, he just wouldn't have been able to catch the bus because they just weren't running. And the woman who reported this sighting noted that he didn't have a car with him, he was definitely traveling by foot. She told authorities that she had noticed he hadn't been wearing any coat and he looked noticeably dirty, which she initially picked up on but she wasn't really surprised at because like I said the weather was particularly strange, it was very very cold and snowy that night. According to the description that the woman had given, this man had relatively matched the appearance of Ron and potentially he had been wearing very similar clothes from what they could tell, however it could never be officially confirmed or denied whether or not this was just a coincidence or whether it was in fact Ron. And there were mixed responses from the people who knew Ron following this sighting being reported, with some of them being convinced that it was Ron and that something strange had happened to him, while others were adamant there was no way that it could have been Ron. Another strange discovery had been that exactly five months prior to his disappearance, Ron had actually walked into a coroner's office away from campus, so it was in Butler County in Ohio, and he'd requested for them to carry out a blood type analysis or a blood type test. He didn't really give a reason, but the the people working there essentially they said it was strange they hadn't expected it because it wasn't really a common thing for people to walk into a coroner's office and request to have their blood type tested and like i said there was no information regarding why he'd wanted to have this test done and why he didn't do it closer to campus maybe at a doctor's office or why he hadn't even gone somewhere on campus because no doubt the campus would have had some form of doctor's office there's just a lot of questions about this whole scenario, this whole finding, it was just very strange why he even wanted to know his blood type in the first place and hadn't thought to contact his family about it. And there have been a couple of theories surrounding why people think he may have done this. One of them that I saw had been that some people believe that he may have had an induction day planned before officially becoming a member of the army and an examination prior to joining would have meant that he needed to know his blood type. Um, but to my knowledge, I couldn't really find anything too solid about this suggestion. It does seem realistic and it does seem likely, but I don't know if there's any like, I couldn't tell if there was any actual evidence that this theory was based on. Ron's last visit to his parents prior to his mysterious disappearance had been around a week before he was last seen. And according to his family, they didn't get any indication that he was in trouble or he was struggling with anything or that anything would happen to him. He'd told them that he had joined the wrestling team at university and he was joining the school band. Um, he was doing well in all his classes and that he'd chosen to graduate as a business major. So sort of just normal updates from, from, from a student who'd moved away to uni telling his parents about what he's doing with his free time. And his parents told the authorities that they believed he didn't have a girlfriend at the time, um, although they were convinced that he had been dating, but they knew that he didn't have any sort of steady girlfriend. So that is all of the specific information. Um, it's all a bit jumbled because there's just a lot of speculation and a lot of theories, but I'm going to go specifically on to theories that I have 
found while doing my research now. So I wanted to start this sort of section of the video with the most unexpected and unusual theory that I've come across while doing my research, but it also does seem to be a widely supported one. So a woman named Jennifer Wenger, I apologise for mispronounce that, um, she'd also studied at Miami University in her early adult years and she'd actually taken upon herself to spend years of her life researching Ron's mysterious disappearance in an attempt to solve the case and maybe unearthing some new piece of information since she was so close to where it occurred. Over the span of nearly a decade, she dedicated her time to finding some answers and ultimately, she came up with her own theory about what had happened to Ron. So during her research, Jennifer discovered that Ron's fingerprint data had not been removed from the FBI's database until the year of 2002. And this has struck her as an interesting fact because the typical practice for the FBI is for them to remove this fingerprint data after being stored for seven years following the individual's death. And this is sort of the time frame in which they would have reason to remove the fingerprint. But like I said, they've removed the fingerprint from the database in 2002, even though he remained a missing person. This combined with a number of other factors that she'd sort of found in her research led her to speculate that she believed that Ron had been alive and well for quite some years following his disappearance and having not been deceased for over 40 years after he disappeared, which would have been in the late 1990s and this would have explained um, the date in which his fingerprint was removed from the FBI's database. She continued this proposed theory by suggesting that she believed that the professor teaching the psychology class that Ron had been a part of but then he had dropped a couple weeks before his disappearance, that this professor had actually been a recruiter for the CIA and that he had recruited Ron from university. And this theory would indicate that Ron's sudden mysterious disappearance would have been necessary in order for his identity while working in the CIA to be protected and it would explain why the factors just in general just seem so sudden. Similarly to this theory, they're often sort of interlinked. Um, it's an alternative one involving his potential draft into the Korean War. This mainly comes from the fact that his disappearance had occurred during the height of the war and it had been suggested that the drive behind his disappearance maybe had been that he had been drafted and he wanted to run away from the war. I just feel the need to chuck in here that if you haven't already gathered these are just speculated theories, these aren't facts, so these are just um, potential scenarios that people have come up with. So I'm not saying any of this is fact in this sort of theory portion of the video, I just wanted to make sure that you guys could hear some of the potential scenarios that people have come up with to give you guys an idea of where the investigation has taken people. According to one source that I'd read in particular, Ron's sister had allegedly at one point suggested that at the time she'd felt as though this had been um, the likely scenario. So she said that she felt it was likely that he had chosen to disappear as he either wanted to avoid being drafted or that he had in fact joined the military. But this theory does also link quite heavily with the CIA theory as it was known that around the same time as the Korean War was occurring, the CIA had been searching and recruiting for people to join the CIA through universities at the time. When the FBI had taken some involvement in the investigation into Ron's disappearance, they had listed his official cause of disappearance as being the Selective Service Act or uh, the draft into the military. And because of this, many people believe that they maybe know more than they're letting on or that they're actively releasing to the public but once again this is just a theory it's just all interesting to consider. As I briefly mentioned previously there was a period of time in which many people and authorities had agreed on amnesia having an involvement in Ron's disappearance. However, like I said, if this had been the case, it's much more likely that someone would have caught on that there was a student wandering about, confused and dazed, um, possibly not far from his accommodation where he had disappeared. So this has been thrown around a lot, but to me personally, you guys might disagree, but to me it just seems like sort of less likely. And one theory that has been slightly more argued as the years have passed since his disappearance had been that he disappeared as a result of a mishandled fraternity prank. And this theory would link to the dead fish that Ron had discovered inside his bedsheets when he'd returned to his room earlier on in the day, which I said was sort of one of the main factors in this case that confuses me still. Although interestingly, I would just like to point out on the side that I did read actually, putting a fish in someone's bedsheet has been suggested to be an act of a death threat sort of thing. So it's believed that members of the mob would actually carry out this act to threaten someone referring to sleeping with the fishes. So that was just an interesting point. I'm not sure that this whole mob 
theory would necessarily link specifically to Ron's case, but it's definitely an interesting fact to consider. More realistically, as people have suggested, it's that his fraternity brothers had attempted to play a prank on the student, but he had died as a result. And in an attempt to cover it up, one of the fraternity brothers had dressed up in Ron's clothing and travelled outside of campus, knocked on the woman's door who'd allegedly had a sighting of Ron later that night in an attempt just to sort of throw the authorities off of their scent. Finally, the other main theory that I came across online had been involving an allegedly pregnant girlfriend of his. As I said previously, Ron's family had not been aware of him having a steady girlfriend at the time of his disappearance, but apparently, according to some claims I read online on some sources, um, some other students had allegedly come forward who had also been living in the same accommodation building as him, and they'd apparently gone on record saying that he actually had been seeing a girl who was a student at Indiana University. This could never really be confirmed, and I'm not entirely sure how reliable these claims are, but it has sparked some potential scenarios across the internet relating to his disappearance. And this theory actually links to the discovery that Ron had his blood type tested prior to his disappearance, as it's been suggested that this might have been an alternative reason for him wanting the test. As another reason for having a blood type test would be for things like a marriage license and a paternity test. This theory is a bit of a stretch since, like I said, it isn't based on any solidified evidence and no one knew of him having a girlfriend at the time, but the speculation follows a scenario in which this unknown woman falls pregnant with Ron's child and Ron eventually attempts to run away from the news. But that is everything, so that's all the different theories. It all seems a bit jumbled because it's another one of those cases that doesn't have a lot of definitive evidence and any of the scenarios seem like they could happen. It's just interesting to hear them all. So I'd love to know what you guys think down below. I honestly, with this one, don't really have a clue. <laughs> so it'd be great to hear what you guys think. If any of the theories have jumped out at you, it's seeming likely, or have you seen something else online? That'd be fab. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this interesting and I will see you very soon for another true crime video. Thanks for watching. Bye.